Okay. I'm seeing live. I think we're live, everyone. All right. Just counting down here as we share the event and get ready to connect. Just giving people from all over a chance to connect because we're just getting things started. All right, hi everyone. Um, we are live to air with the Spacesuit Utilization of Innovative Technology Laboratory from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. That's the suit lab. Uh, we've got myself, I'm the principal investigator and professor at Embry-Riddle, Ryan Kobrick, along with all my students here who will be introducing themselves. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about the countdown to, we'll see if it's tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow's launch of the return from US soil to orbital space flight into the International Space Station with SpaceX on their Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, we've got Bob and Doug about to launch and they're getting ready. And something we're all excited about are spacesuits. So we really wanna take this moment to try to share our love and our knowledge of suits and show you a little bit about um, what we've noticed about these as well. So without further ado, I'm just gonna kind of go around the horn here, introduce the students. Um, so. Uh, Nick, Mike, if you guys want to kick it off. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nick Lopek. I'm uh, the research manager at the Suit Lab. I've been with the lab since its beginning, and I've been fortunate enough to participate in tons of spacesuit research projects. And right now, I'm working remotely for NASA as an intern as a spacesuit engineer with the XEMU spacesuit. Hello, I'm Michael. I've also worked on a bunch of projects with the Spacesuit Lab as well. And currently, I'm on a uh, Project Alexi, which is the 2020 NASA Suits Challenge. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nico. I am uh, working on the MicroG Next project with the Suit Lab. I have been in the Suit Lab for the past about a year, and um, I'm also currently interning at Northrop Grumman on the NASA Sounding Rocket Operations contract. Hey, everyone. I'm Chase Cavello. I've been uh, working in the Space Suit Lab for over two years now, been uh, working on different projects like MicroGenex of 2019 and a bunch of different uh, motion capture projects as well. And I'm also interning uh, remotely at NASA Johnson Space Center currently. Hi, um, I'm Kat um, Turnus. Um, I uh, have a background in marine biology. I'm pretty new to the suit lab as of this year. Um, and um, I'm an engineer on the MicroGenex Challenge with uh, Nick and uh, Nico. Cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. And we're, we'd like to also thank Explore Mars, Janet's Planet, uh, Stardom for being part of the back end today and hosting us, making this live. Um, this is the first time we've done a group kind of live chat about a research topic slash, you know, mini research topic, if you will, because we're diving into what everyone keeps asking about in the SpaceX suit. So before we go into details, uh, there's a lot of people who might be the first time that they've even talked about or thought about spacesuits. So we really wanna do kind of a spacesuit 101 session. So I, I prepared a very short presentation. Yeah, it's PowerPoint, cause I'm a professor and that's what, how I, that's my craft, that's what I do. Um, but trust me, it's all photos, so don't worry. Um, let me just open it up for everyone. All right, off we go. So spacesuit 101. So this is the first look that people had really at the spacesuit in a space environment. This is not quite the right environment for the suit. This is Starman uh, launched from a Falcon Heavy and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but why spacesuits? What are spacesuits? Well, spacesuits are the tiniest possible spacecraft that ever existed. Uh, everything you need to survive in the vacuum of space is right there in that one little photo. Uh, that's Bruce McCandless testing out the uh, early version of the jetpack maneuvering system on the MMU. 
Um, so it's free floating uh, away from the space shuttle in this photo. And so that's everything you need to know in terms of survival is right inside of that. So let's talk about what's inside of that. So really there's fundamental tiers of life support. Number one, a spacesuit absolutely needs to keep the person alive if it's being used in its you know, emergency situation or its natural situation. Um, and then the second level is being able to work and function. So after we know that everyone's alive, they need to be able to either you know, push the right buttons, use the right tool, maneuver, do what they need to do. And number three is comfort, because um, although we always want to provide comfort uh, as best as possible, if it comes to a situation where we really just need to get the person down in an emergency situation, then you know comfort can kind of wait until uh, a later point. But that is part of how we uh, think about these levels of life support. So there's this rule of threes that everyone should be kind of aware of. Uh, without three seconds of pressure, your body would rapidly expand and uh, it's a messy situation. Your saliva would boil right off of your tongue. Um, three minutes without oxygen, as you know, you can actually be unconscious, not breathing for multiple minutes. Well, without three minutes of oxygen, you start risking damage to your brain and everything else. Um, three hours without shelter if you're in an extreme environment. Three days without water. So, you know, if we think about the future of exploration, it takes three days to go to the moon and three days to come home. So if there's a really big emergency and the crew doesn't have water for that return flight home from the moon, well, they're gonna survive. They're not gonna be in great shape, but three days without water. And then finally on the rule of threes, the three weeks without food. So you need nourishment. Obviously as each day ticks by, um, you start to degrade and things are a lot tougher. You actually need food more often than you know waiting three weeks, but three weeks is how long you could actually last. So this is an eyesore of a chart, but we wanted to share it. Um, this is the human body. When we think about human in the center of design, uh, we really need to think about, well, what is it about the inputs and outputs of a human that we really need to focus on? And so what we see here is absolutely all the things that go into your body and come out of your body. So oxygen, uh, potable water, meaning drinkable water and food need to go in. That's the energy to give you the energy you need to function. And then everything else on the right there is what's going out. So you've got trace contaminants, you generate heat. So that's something the spacesuit needs to deal with. Uh, CO2 is out is the major byproduct that we need to remove because if it builds up, it could be toxic. Um, it can make the crew pass out. A lot of bad things go wrong. And then of course, your actual human waste that need to be de dealt with. Um, and then finally, this is just kind of a crazy fun chart to look at because you've got your human in the center of the design and all those inputs and outputs are going all over the place. And these are kind of like the key systems of a spacecraft. So now if you think about it, well, the suit might need to plug into the spacecraft. Well, these are all the things that you have to keep in mind to manage that suit, uh, keep the human alive and healthy and hopefully comfortable. And then finally, the psychological side of things is, you know, actually being human. And I mean, there's a reason why there's an intense astronaut selection is because they're looking for the best of the best. And so NASA's hashtags up there, the be an astronaut, I think is a good mantra for how we want to live our lives and help other people as well. Um, so the current suits, we've got EVA and IVA. EVA is extravehicular activity, meaning outside of the spacecraft. And IVA is intravehicular activity, meaning inside the spacecraft. So the EVA suits that are used for spacewalks on space stations, there's two of the current ones, the Americans EMU and then the Russians Orlan suit. Um, at the moment, until tomorrow, hopefully, um, or soon after, you know, we're, we have to be patient about this launch, uh, especially looking out my Florida window here, it's been raining for the past few days. But the IVA suit is really what the SpaceX suit that we're going to be looking at because it needs to function inside of the spacecraft and the SOCOL is the current suit. So there's a lot of suits that are being designed right now. On the left, we have the XEMU designed by NASA to hopefully return us to the moon. Uh, so our moonwalkers might be wearing something that has the upgraded look here with the better tighter shoulders, if you will, to give more mobility. Then the SpaceX suit is the next one followed by the Boeing blue suit made by David Clark. And then finally, the Orion uh, survival escape suit on the far right, also made by David Clark, that would be flying inside of uh, Orion for Lockheed. Finally, we have ILC Dover has new concepts they're working on for both IVA, EVA, and other countries are also looking at designing their own suits. So we've got a Indian suit that's based off of Russian heritage on the right there as well. So finally, just a kind of plug for the lab, please follow us social media. All our handles are at spacesuit up. Um, and we hope you enjoy this uh, preview of the SpaceX suit that we're about to go into. So let me 
stop sharing my screen here for a second as we uh, transition. Um, so the SpaceX spacesuit is going to be pretty exciting to talk about. The number one thing to know about is that it's made by SpaceX. It's made in-house. And I'm going to hand it over to Chase to talk about the suits. And we're going to show you some photos as we're chatting to you. So yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, SpaceX's new suit. Um, one of the big things that we want to talk about is all the requirements that it had to meet uh, in order to become a functioning suit that NASA approved. So in the commercial crew uh, program contract that NASA has with SpaceX, they, their suit that SpaceX designed had to be able to meet the different requirements that NASA had. Some of those are, uh, it has to provide pressure in an event of emergency. Um, it also has to be able to uh, prevent, protect the crew member if there's a fire um, or other things like that. Um, and as Dr. Kobrick mentioned before, uh, it is that sort of last line of defense in the event of an emergency, sort of that smaller spacesuit within a, uh, a smaller spacecraft within a spacecraft. Some of its uh, specific design requirements are that it has to be able to maintain a 3.5 PSI pressure in the event of a rapid depressed situation, and that's 100% oxygen. So that's what we would use to keep our crew members safe if the spacecraft had a catastrophic failure. It also has to be able to function on the ground with our current atmosphere of about 14.7 PSI. And then that's just standard, um, your normal air mixture. Um, but yeah. Cool, thank you, Chase. Um, now over to Kat to talk about kind of the top level on the suit um, as I bring up some more photos for you guys. Okay, um, so overall um, it has kind of an iconic uh, image. Um, it was designed um, by Benji, Benji Reed um, made a comment. Um, he's the SpaceX mission director uh, that it's important that the suits are um, comfortable but also inspiring. So they really aimed um, to make the suits um, in that direction. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they hired Jose Fernandez, who's a Hollywood uh, costume designer who worked on, uh, you know, both DC and Marvel movies. Um, so you can kind of see how that carries through um, in its image. Um, it's also very lightweight. Um, the advanced crew spacesuit, the um, kind of uh, iconic image, the pumpkin suit from the shuttle era, weighed about 28 pounds. And this, uh, just the suit alone, uh, weighs about 20 pounds. So that uh, that extra, or that that eight pounds less um, can really make a difference in, um, in egress. Um, if you show the next image, Ryan. Um, yeah, you can you can see how uh, it um, you can you can get away quickly if that if, you, if it's a little lighter. Um, also, it's uh, designed to work really well with the Dragon uh, spacecraft itself. Um, so you can see here how the uh, the helmets fit very well inside the inside the chairs, um, and and it and it uh, is very snug around the suit itself. Um, they, it's custom fitted to each astronaut. Um, so the older suits were kind of um, small, medium, large kind of kind of deal. Uh, this actually um, is fitted to the astronaut itself. So each one will get um, something unique to them. Um, it is also all in uh, one piece. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I believe. Um, the next one, yeah. Um, yeah, you see um, here, they, there's a zipper on the inseam of their uh, pant leg um, and they actually uh, unzip that and get up in the inside of it. Um, and the helmet is actually the last part, um, which is quite unique to uh, this design. Um, and I'll pass it over now to Nico, who will tell you a little more about the uh, helmet. I was on mute, my apologies. Um, just like the rest of the suit, the uh, helmet is very iconic and it's nothing like we've ever seen before with uh, spacesuits. Um, and to me, and I'm sure a lot of people think this, it looks like it's straight out of the sci-fi movie. Um, and not only does it look cool, but it has a ton of um, upgraded features that we've never seen in spacesuit helmets before. Specifically, uh, you can see the side profile of the helmet here. The entire helmet is 3D printed out of ABS, uh, which makes it super light. It limits down on uh, heavy materials like metals. Um, and they tried to make it as easy to manufacture as possible for when they custom uh, fit it to every astronaut. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, here is a kind of close-up view of Doug wearing the uh, 
helmet. And you can see up in the chin bar area, there's the uh, rubber gasket that goes all the way around, which is to seal the pressure in, as well as you have the two latches in the front of the helmet, uh, which actually require two buttons to be pressed to open up the clamshell visor. And then going back uh, further on the uh, bar, you have a little uh, round hole. And from our observations, we believe that, our, that that is a purge valve for the used air of the astronauts to vent back out into the cabin of the uh, spacecraft. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a closer view of what that clamshell effect does. So instead of just the visor coming back on the helmet, the entire helmet kind of rotates back. Um, and like Kat said, this is one piece, so it's integrated into the suit and it can't be taken off. And what that means is that it needs to be very important. And Bob and Doug have actually noted how comfortable this helmet is. They said it can be worn easily for long, longer periods of time, uh, which makes it uh, not being able to take it off, not a problem. Uh, next slide, please. And here is an image of them doing a pressure test. And you can see up uh, how the helmet fits when the suits are under pressure. And one thing that's different about uh, this helmet is uh, because it's integrated into the suit, it has no neck ring. And because there's no neck ring, that limits, again, down on weight, and it makes it more comfortable because, like previous suits, uh, the big metal neck ring made it really uncomfortable and really hard to have a lot of mobility in the suit. So, yeah. And now we'll pass it on to Nick to talk about the layers and materials in the SpaceX suit. Yeah, so the SpaceX suit is uh, really intriguing. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see what's going on under the hood, if you will, under that cover layer. But really, the suit has been described by Benji Reed as having two main layers. It's very probable that the suit actually has multiple actual layers, but two main layers, which are described as the outer layer or cover layer and the inner bladder layer, which actually holds the pressure of the suit, allowing the astronauts to stay safe in the event of a decompression event. Um, so these layers uh, in traditional spacesuit technology. The bladder layer is typically a mylar material, very good at holding uh, air in without leaks, uh, similar to balloons and, and high durability tires. But then the outer layer has to have uh, Nomex and Teflon materials to be more fire resistant and uh, temperature insulating in the event that the capsule loses uh, temperature regulation. Uh, so as mentioned before, the suit is one piece. Uh, so it's, it's very easy to sew, and donning the suit requires that the astronauts um, put the suit on, kind of unzip the crotch area that Kat referenced, and kind of dive up and into the suit. And they, the helmet is also integrated, so they'll slide right into the helmet. And uh, the only other zippers that uh, are there are on the gloves, which Mike will talk about momentarily. And there are two, one, two pressure uh, zippers, one on each glove, and then one on the crotch. So as I said, it's easy to stow. The, the elbows and the knees have neat like convolutes to allow for some of that mobility in the legs and the arms. Um, there's actually reflective material kind of around the outer layer. So uh, if there's any reason the crew might be picked up at night, their suits will reflect any light uh, coming onto them. Interestingly, the patches that are traditionally sewn and woven are now vinyl, kind of upgrading to the modern era. And um, we're not sure of how the suit actually defogs via the helmet, but it's speculated that air gets to circulate through the helmet and the entire suit and kind of processes that fog. Um, so I'll pass it to Mike and he'll tell you about the gloves, which are very unique to the suit. Uh, so what's unique about the gloves and thank Nick for uh, discussing the layers is you can actually see the, uh, the first zipper, the white thin zipper is the outer or cover of the glove, and then you have the red tag, which is the inner uh, inner layer, which is like the bladder system of holding in pressure and ensuring that the pressure doesn't leak to ensure uh, safety in, uh, for the astronauts. And what's unique about the glove is, Cobra, can we go to the next slide real quick? Is that since it's a uh, one uh, layer and in what you can do is you can roll up the suit. If you take off the uh, inner and outer layer of the zippers and you can roll it up and use it to uh, 
either grasp on things easier, such as touchscreens or manual control options that are what's in the Crew Dragon capsule. So here you can see the touchscreen. And what the touchscreen allows them to do is there's three and also there's, a, I believe, a tablet as well. And so what's unique about this is that these gloves are touchscreen sensitive. And so you can either use the uh, Dragon Crew capsule either with your gloves on or with them off. And what's different about this is that there's no bearings like a traditional uh, astronaut spacesuit where the gloves immediately can be like separated, disconnected from the suit. These can just be simply rolled on or be kept on with ease of comfort because they're designed not only for like uh, as a one piece fitting, but they're specifically customized for each uh, astronaut individually. And then uh, I'll take it back. So we're going to talk a little bit about mission ops, kind of how this suit that we've just described kind of from top to bottom fits into the whole operations of this mission coming up, which we're hoping launches tomorrow or in the next few days, weather permitting. And, you know, through this launch, we'll actually get a ton more information about how these suits are used in real space missions. This will be the first time this suit has been to space. Um, they've done plenty of pressure tests, but we'll hopefully learn more about the donned off procedure. Um, it's interesting, Kirby, if you could show the slide. Uh, so how does the suit actually get pressure? This is very unique to this suit. Uh, so here you can see, it kind of looks like a seamless suit. There's no ports. Uh, a lot of spacesuits are famous for having shiny metal ports uh, on the suit that you have your big hoses connect to. Well, SpaceX has done something innovative here and hidden the port in a very sl slim, streamlined way. If you look at Bob on the left side of the screen on his thigh, there's a small little cover that that's where the actual magic happens. So if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, some of the pressure testing. So you see on the left, Doug has is hooked up to a portable ventilator and you can see that the port uh, is right there on his thigh. And not only does that port allow for pressure and ventilation, but we'll see also it allows for power and communications all through one port that seamlessly integrates into the Dragon. If you kind of look at the pressure testing going on here, on the top of th Doug's thigh, you can see that that line is plugged in, but there will be a better shot of it in the next slide. Um, so you can see actually here that uh, they're kind of covering the valve with their hands, but I have a clear shot in the next one. But here is interesting uh, there too. The, the harness system that actually holds them in is like a five point harness similar to race car seats. And you can see the Dragon is really inspired by that kind of style of seats. And as Kat had mentioned, it, it's very uh, fitting to the suit, which really enhances safety and comfort. Um, and that's part of the harness system. You see the harnesses have white straps on them. That's for quick removal of the crew if they need to be rescued. Um, and Kobe, if you go to the next slide. This is very unique, uh, very exciting for spacesuits. This kind of port, um, it's, it's, it's almost like just one plug, one cable, and your suit's all good to go. You've got pressure, power communications all through that port. So you can see in the smaller circle on the image, um, that's where it plugs in and the Dragon cable is actually very thin and it goes nicely into the seat. And uh, in the enhanced uh, blown up view, you can see what that port actually looks like. And it's looking like there's uh, separate ports for pressure, power and communications there um, on the suit. So we're very excited about that in, in terms of spacesuit technology, something that's a little more streamlined than having so many different lines and, and uh, ports everywhere. Uh, so we just go to the next slide. And as we were talking about, you know, the suit interfaces with the Dragon capsule via their hands. They're using their hands very constantly to maneuver all controls of the suit and um, of the spacecraft as well. And at times they might even take off the suit. And this, the suit is very easy to don and doff on their own and they might stow the suit in the Dragon during this mission as well. It's important to note that Demo 2, this launch coming up, is a test flight. Jim Bridenstine loves to mention that this is a test flight. The purpose of this mission is to test the vehicle but not, and test the spacesuits, and so the astronauts can really get an understanding of how the Dragon ecosystem really works, and that involves spacesuit testing. They'll even be sleeping uh, during the missions just so they get a full view of everything. And if you look on the fly, of the astronaut in this image, uh, there's like even an iPad. So SpaceX is really going for the full kind of future of spacecraft um, feeling here. And that iPad can be strapped to their thigh of their spacesuit via special Velcro 
um, thigh hugger, but it can also be put above the uh, touchscreen panel, and I kind of like to call it the thigh pad. Um, so next slide. We're really excited for this mission. Uh, we're really excited to see Bob and Doug return us to uh, the International Space Station from American soil on American rockets, as Jim loves to put it. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft is really awesome. So if you guys in the audience, anyone who's watching, we've been taking questions. Uh, we'll be answering questions about the mission, about the suits, uh, and we really enjoy talking to you guys. So thank you. And we'll start the, the Q&A now. All right, thanks everyone. Um, just one clarification, this is the first time the suit is going to fly in space with humans inside of it. There's sure. been two, two suits that have flown to space. Uh, the first being Starman, which you can see in the background of Chase's uh, Tesla Roadster there. Uh, and the second being Ripley, that was part of the demo flight where they wanted to you know, put the actual uh, suit in the right position and also do uh, radiation measuring and all the fun stuff that you would do. Make sure all the systems are flowing and check out all those things first. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions. But before that, uh, we definitely want to highlight what all these students have been working on over the last three years in the lab. So we actually have our lab video that we've got queued up. Um, I hope that some of you have already seen it. But just for those who might be new to this whole thing, um, you know, here's a four minute Four minutes of awesome, as I like to call it, um, edited, produced, to put together by Nick Lopak. Um, and yeah, just enjoy the video and we'll be back with Q&A for the second half of this. I'm so, so lost I'm always in a hurry And I know, know 
Peace out, yo. Space suit up. All right. So I hope that played smoothly for people. If not, uh, we dropped the link in our Facebook uh, page chat of the live chat of this, but also it's on our Facebook page. It's pretty much everywhere on all our social media at Space Suit Up. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just kind of go through them in order and uh, anyone who wants to jump in. Some of these things we have covered, but people might have missed certain parts of the chat or might want to hear it again. So um, we'll kind of just bounce them around the team here. Uh, so from Kate, Kate was asking what the spacesuits are made out of. Uh, sure. So I covered the materials earlier. So uh, spacesuits are made of a lot of different materials, but particularly with this suit, uh, that what we know, what's been mentioned by the SpaceX team is that for the bladder layer, it's likely they're using a mylar material that's common in most spacesuit designs, which are used to hold the pressure in. The white outer layer that you see commonly through all these pictures is a mix of Teflon and Nomex. Both of these materials are known for having high temperature resistance. So in the event of a fire or loss of temperature regulation, these things would be act as an insulating material that keeps the pressure in. And as Nico mentioned when he commented on the helmet's design, it's actually a 3D printed helmet using ABS plastic, which is a standard 3D printing material. Um, as far as other materials, there are touch, touch screen sensitive uh, gloves. So that's, a, that's another common coating. And um, a lot of uh, common things actually uh, used on the suit. Yeah, and um, there's actually kind of a side follow-up question. Um, somebody was asking about what the zippers specifically were made out of. Um, that's a very specific question. It's a great question because they said theirs are always jamming. Um, maybe we can kind of reiterate the ops about how do you zip your gloves up? We'll go to our, our glove expert on this. Uh, yeah, so not really too sure on what the materials are made of, although the outer layer zipper seems like a typical regular zipper, but the inner layer that keeps the pressure in would be assuming very thick, uh, high fidelity zippers. Uh, something to keep pressure in very tightly it is known that zippers have been used on previous IVA um, suits. Uh, so it could be following along those trend lines or something that could be used, for example, like uh, scuba diving like suits that keep water like in, like those, like depending on the suit could have really thick uh, zippers um, to make sure it doesn't get like stick or like jammed when like unzipping or trying to take it off. I'm sure it's probably coded very well. And they've ran hundreds of tests on simulations, testing what it's like taking the suit on and off, especially the gloves and using it on the control panels and touch screens to make sure that everything hopefully goes well for the launch tomorrow. Yeah. And, um, the, um, so that was from Elizabeth Forbes Wallace. Thanks again for your question. questions. There's a few questions. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other thing to kind of point out on the suits, because this is, is kind of a novel way of doing gloves, is that before they would use these hard steel kind of connection rings. And so that's what we see on a lot of the other suits. And one of the other things we do see on a lot of um, IVA and EVA suits is the pressure layers usually um, uh, retain the shape by a link net type material that usually helps distribute the pressure across the suit materials. Um, this is a kind of a hard question. So, I mean, people are kind of open to their opinion on this, but um, Jesse Burdett was asking if COVID-19 messed up anything with the Crew Dragon launch. Um, that's, I don't know if, I mean, that's kind of an opinion question. I don't know if anyone wants to kind of chime in on that because we're not SpaceX, we're the, you know, part of Embry-Riddle, so. Just 
from seeing pictures of them getting the suits on and off and doing testing, all the uh, staff members have been wearing face masks and I assume mm -hmm. gloves as well. Even hair caps as well. So yeah, I assume NASA and SpaceX are making it top priority, make sure that there's no COVID at all. Hopefully yeah. not within the staff members and the astronauts. Someone did so ask this in the press briefing, actually, um, and uh, I, one of the Johnson execs had actually mentioned that um, they are sterilizing the rooms and making sure that everything is wiped down, like in mission control, um, before they before they um, actually let anybody in. So they are taking precautions, but I don't know if anything's affected the actual progression of events. I can also comment on this a little bit. Um, uh, working with uh, a team at Johnson Space Center over the spring. Uh, that had a hand in training. And I know that over the course of, you know, them prepping for the launch in Cape Canaveral, uh, they basically always go through a series of quarantines, especially right before launch. Um, so I know that extra precautions were taken to isolate the crew members before launch, as well as during their normal quarantine uh, preparations. So I don't know that it affected it too much. Um, ultimately, we'd have to ask them in person, but um, mm -hmm. it sounds like it was somewhat still within line of NASA's uh, strict safety precautions. Yeah, we we're just showing uh, some NASA B-roll of their training there in the inside. But yeah, this is a very interesting time that we live in. And um, it's also you know unique and fantastic that we can actually have the operations team come together to be able to get this crew launched safely off the ground, hopefully. Um, and you know that's that's very challenging when you want to have your entire team there. Um, even the quarantine of the families is tricky, where uh, the the families flew out just you know yesterday, um, and it's just it's a different kind of uh, uh, feeling to it. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of people in the press that have mentioned that you know they're they're upset or they they understand, but they're upset that they can't be there uh, covering it. So it's um, almost like a quieter atmosphere in general. Um, there's a lot of us that were able to attend the last shuttle flights where, you know, it was a lot of fun and very crowded, though. Um, all right, let's go to the next question. Uh, lots of little questions here popping up. Let's see. Um, okay, so uh, this is about temperature. Jesse James Burdett asks, does the suit have any sort of integrated heat modules or is it already temperature sensitive? Um, so you can add those in. Uh, if somebody wants to talk about temperature. How do they do temperature in the suit? <laughs> it seems the temperature is regulated similar to most IVA suits where it's simply through the air temperature that comes into the suit. If you notice in uh, some of our slides, there is even a portable ventilator that the astronauts can carry with them out on their way to the pad so they can regulate the, their own temperature in the Florida heat. Um, this, the dragging capsule is also temperature regulated. So you have suit regulation of temperature and dragon temperature regulation. Um, so the suit's more of a backup and also, well, it's absolutely necessary. If there wasn't cooled air, the suit would get hot very quickly from the body heat of the astronaut. Um, so uh, cool air enters the suit and through the ports on the sides of the helmet that Nico introduced, um, used or spent air is uh, exhausted into the Dragon's uh, you know, air system and that's also ventilated. So there is mainly air uh, ventilation of regulation of temperature. I haven't heard uh, anything about heating pads, whether that's in the suit or the dragon seats themselves. Yeah, it's most likely just all through the air cooling. Um, uh, other suits have used liquid cooling ventilation garments. Those are usually used for EVA to help with the uh, body temperature regulation. Um, but that is something that we, you know, smart materials can help with, um, you know, humidity, moisture, sweating, and uh, controlling that so that it's comfortable. Because so um, something we didn't talk about is the timeline. Four hours before launch is when the astronauts put these suits on. Um, and then approximately two hours, like halfway through that, is when they're actually seated in the capsule. So they kind of have a two, it's not a two hours to get there. They're, you know, it's pretty quick to get to the launch pad. Um, but then they have the two hours that they're on their backs and then the launch occurs. And then of course they have to check out all the systems. So they're still in the suit. So we're talking about six plus, at least six plus hours inside of that spacesuit. Um, and I, I kind of think of it more of as like you're wearing a dry suit more than anything else. You just can't take it off. So everything has to be uh, 
taken care of, if you will. Um, so we have a question. This is, uh, it's always fun to take the offbeat question. So for Miss Cat, is going to outer space scary? Um, great question. Um, I think uh, for each astronaut, depending on um, what, you know, how you ask them, they, they might give you a different answer. Um, but I remember uh, Luca Parmitano, who's a, a um, famous Italian astronaut who actually had a very scary instance happen to him. Um, he made a, a very poignant quote about um, how I don't think that he doesn't think that any astronaut doesn't experience fear um, and that um, it's something that they're able to use to gauge safety and be able to um, approach the, the risks um, with, with much more careful consideration. Um, but some, some uh, astronauts may, may give you a much more um, uh, like bravado answer and say they don't experience fear. But I, I think that you know, these astronauts are so well prepared for, for the experience that um, you know, nervousness is normal, but um, you know, they're going in knowing what, what they're in for. So um, it's all about preparation, I think, at the end of the day. Awesome. Um, we had a question uh, uh, later on that was asking about, could this suit be used for an EVA? So who would like to answer that question? Nico, do you want to hit that one? Yeah, definitely. Um, as far as we know that this suit is only for IVA and for use in the Dragon capsule and maybe for use with the Starship later on once that starts flying, um, SpaceX has released, you know, little uh, animations of the suit going out on Mars and that kind of thing. But as far as uh, what we know about the suit, that's really just to press, uh, you know, to try, try and get hype up. Um, this suit is designed to work with the capsule. Um, that plug on the thigh that Nick talked about, it, you know, the astronauts really depend on that for um, air and temperature regulation and pressure. And they wouldn't have that capability outside the capsule. So this suit is purely for riding the Dragon up to the International Space Station and back. And um, we don't have any information on whether SpaceX is developing an EVA suit or not, but that'd be really cool information to hopefully uh, find out in the future. So, yeah. Yeah, hopefully our next uh, spacesuit chat will be talking about that, right? But yeah, there's a lot lot more significant layers that are needed for EVA. Uh, mostly it's the thermal environment, dealing with micrometeorite protection, um, and so and radiation. So without the right layering, it's not really safe to leave the capsule. Um, you know, in a crazy emergency situation, you could uh, literally inflate the astronaut with a emergency oxygen bottle and push them from one airlock to the other, but they're going to get cold extremely fast. This is not something that can regulate the temperature properly. Um, so a fun question, since you mentioned um, riding the dragon, this is my question for you guys, surprise question. Um, if So all these suits have had names, like uh, not all of them, but a lot of them have had names. Um, the Russian suits have traditionally been in some type of bird. Um, and so my question for you is what would you name the SpaceX spacesuit if you needed to give it like a, a cool design name? Mm. Yeah. They're so good at naming things at SpaceX. I, I, I'm surprised they haven't named it themselves, but I think Starman has been so iconic and I, I don't want to appropriate the suit's gender or anything, but Starman to me is what I see when I look at the suit. It's just so that mission was iconic to me. And uh, I'll have to think on a better name, but really okay. Starman is what I associate with the suit. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and you caught me off guard <clears throat> for a second. Um, I'm going to have to probably go with Nick with Starman or even like Star Boy, taking it from like the weekend and the <laughs> Daft Punk type of vibe that SpaceX kind of gives off with them. So I'll probably go with like either of those two names, honestly. Maybe like Star Walker. Yeah, well, that's a good one. There you go. Yeah, Star Walker. Anyone else have one? I mean, he's known for naming things after science fiction. So, um, you know, I don't know that I could predict what what Elon would would say, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like a stormtrooper type deal, um, just from the full white. But yeah, might have a series of numbers and letters. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
So I've got something to share with you guys. I don't know if I've ever shown this to my students. Well, really, maybe only to a handful of people. But a decade ago, I interviewed for the spacesuit design engineer position with SpaceX. And kind of as a joke, but also just kind of for just for fun, because I like to throw things that are fun in there. Um, I had my name for it. And I would name it the Excalibur, because it would be the protection for dragon riders. Um, and then as you can see in the corner there, if you can't read it, it says suit not to scale or reality. Um, so that would just be something fun to do. So if you have an idea in the audience, um, throw it up in the Facebook chat. Maybe we'll be able to catch them and pop them into our, our stream here as well. Uh, does anyone else have any before we go to the next question? I was going to say something about like riding a dragon, like the rider or something like that. That'd be cool. And you could probably make an acronym out of it. Yeah, definitely. You got to have, yeah. We're, we love acronyms. Um, it's kind of one of those things like, oh, everything's an acronym. But then once you're like involved with space flight activities, you're like, you start to get addicted to these acronyms. And you're like, I need to have acronyms everywhere. They're, they're just, they're part of the personality of the space flight program. They give meaning. They, you know, they have all obviously a lot of thought that goes behind them. Um, but it's also something that, you know, you don't want to be like laughing at it, but you do want to smile when you hear the acronym. And there's a lot of cool space acronyms out there. Like, the current jetpack piece that's on the EMU uh, EVA suit. See, there's a whole bunch of acronyms right there. It's called the SAFER. And like, what cooler device than SAFER to get you home safe with a little jetpack? So we've got a, a really intense question here, a great question from Jason Reimuller, who we know from Project Possum. And he was asking, what about the post-landing considerations like the preserver units and egress bottles? Um, that's a tough question. Does anyone want to see if they can tiptoe around that one and give some sort of info? Visually from the suit, this is all speculation. Nothing I've heard about confirmation, but for rescue operations with the Dragon, I believe a raft, separate rafts not integrated to the suit will have to be used for flotation um, in terms of rescue. I don't think the suit, like the Asus from the shuttle era, does. I don't think this suit has any integrated um, life preserving uh, oceanic devices, basically. Um, I think it would be a raft system uh, where they have self inflating devices that are part of the emergency protocol. Yeah, one one other thing to note here is that the previous suits for the space shuttle program, the ACES, which is also an acronym, uh, are also known as the pumpkin suits. And why were they pumpkin? Because they were safety orange, so they could pick them out of the ocean. Um, so that's part of the ops and safety side of things as well. Um, so uh, this is a question about fit. Uh, what is the smallest height an astronaut could be for the suit? It's almost a trick question. Yeah, I mean <laughs> In theory, any size, perhaps, if the suits are tailor-made, um, unless there's dragon requirements, I'm sure there are requirements for the seats, um, yep. just like a roller coaster. Um, you know, there, there's probably a minimum height and a maximum height for the seats of the vehicle itself. But in terms of the suit, it seems everything is custom made down from the helmet to the layers, the boots, the gloves. So in theory, anybody could have one, but it's about whether you uh, can integrate into the dragon itself. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it. It's it's not just the suit, it's the seat. It's everything else that's around them um, that's part of the system. So um, if the seat can accommodate the person suited, then that's kind of a, that's a big part of it as well. Um, we got a lot of uh, messages and hellos and thank you for your work. So thank you for our people that, uh, friends and family, um, we answered one of the questions, but just hello to 17-year-old Tavaswani who met through uh, Janet's Planet's channel. Um, and keep asking those hard questions. You got awesome questions on all the things that we've we've connected with. Um, hello to Tahir, who is also asking us questions and saying thank you for um, our work and our knowledge. Um, so there's a bunch. Let's see what else we got here. Um, so those ones are kind of repeating. So that we've, I'm glad we're answering the question, getting to these questions. Um, so comparisons or comments from previous or astronaut candidates about the new space design, spacesuit design, um, any former astronauts weighing in on the new design. So, I mean, those are kind of, you know, analytical or anecdotal that we've heard from, you know, through the grapevine. So I don't know if you guys, we've already mentioned that the, with the astronauts have, 
the current astronauts that are wearing them have said that they're comfortable. Have you guys heard of from other astronauts what their feedback is and you know what I, they've I, noticed? I, I, there are okay. some there are some articles and interviews with uh, Benji Reed, uh, who we referenced a few times. While he's not the suit, uh, he's not a suit architect. However, he's involved in the entirety of the mission, the, the mission development. Um, I've heard that. Uh, not only are Bob and Doug highly involved in the suit design, but of course, all the commercial crew astronauts and even former astronauts um, weighed in on this design. And uh, I think the reason yeah. the suit looks the way it is and functions the way it is, is heavily uh, inspired and, and uh, pushed by things that astronauts want. Like the, the key takeaways from this suit for me are ease of use. Um, such as the gloves, the, the helmet visor goes up very quickly and easily. Uh, weight wise, it's, it's very lightweight uh, and it can be stowed easily. I can very much picture astronauts asking for those things when you compare this suit to an ASUS, which was the, the heritage, the prior suit for the shuttle. So um, I think this suit's designed heavily in, influenced by astronaut um, involvement, but of course, SpaceX adds their flair and wants to make it look good and function as the astronauts request to add on cool. to that real to add on to that really quickly um doug who is actually flying on the mission he flew on the last shuttle mission so he has experience wearing the previous pumpkin suit on the shuttle and he um you know he's mentioned how comfortable the suit is so coming from somebody that's an astronaut that's flown on the previous method of space transportation um that really shows how uh SpaceX has designed the suit with astronauts uh, input in mind. Awesome. Um, so we're getting to the, the end of our kind of hour here. So I do want to wrap up because there's so many things that are happening on this uh, T minus one day before launch. And I want to make sure that people can tune into as many of these cool things as possible. We're happy to answer more questions through, you know, social media, uh, Facebook comments, chat, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all the above. Our YouTube channel features all our videos as well, so please check that out. Um, there's a nice comment here about they should, uh, Roseanne mentioned that they should name it Hiccup, like how to train your dragon. Um, so yeah, there's that whole connection of, you know, naming things also connects it to your audience a little bit as well. Um, so it's, you know, we met, it was mentioned about sci-fi culture that Kat brought up and, you know, directly linking it to the next generation is important too, because, you know, those are our future Mars walkers. Um, first things first, though, right now, at least, it's onto the moon um, or back to the moon or however you want to phrase it. I'm all just for saying to the moon. Um, and so with that, I'd like to just kind of go around one more time just to see if anyone has any, like, last little bits of comments or things that they've noticed that, they, they, that we missed out on from our team here. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap up. So just kind of go around the room again, same order we started with uh, Nick. I think we covered a lot about the SpaceX suit. It's something that, you know, we, we've been just looking in the past few days collecting this kind of research. And while the suit was announced, well, back in 2017, only now that we're seeing Bob and Doug perform these activities and NASA sharing more about the program, are we learning the real um, details of the suit? And it's very exciting uh, for all of us who like spacesuits here to see a new suit be used in a new vehicle and, new everything it's exciting for everybody involved and i'm looking forward to the nasa will be actually live streaming a feed from the capsule for the entire duration of the mission so you won't want to miss that that's never really been done before on any other missions uh, where we'll be able to see exactly what's going on and uh, i'm sure we'll catch a lot more about how the suit works through that kind of content yeah, thank you mike definitely right uh, I'll be interested to see like how long it takes to like put the suit on or um, just how the communications work, just the ins and outs of the, the suit and how like it actually operates in the capsule. The astronauts, I believe, are also going to be sleeping in the capsule too. So that'll be, I can't imagine sleeping, I don't know, or staying in the capsule that long, but uh, I'm excited as well. And uh, me and Nick and I will probably be going to see the launch also in person too as well. So. Nico, I think you're next. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm actually came down to Florida to watch this uh, launch in person, so I'm. I'm very excited. Uh, and it's gonna be just amazing to see these, this next step in technology actually, uh, 
come to fruition and actually fly to space with humans. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's what I'm excited for. Cool. Chase? Yeah, I mean, I'm just excited as everyone else to see it. Um, I'm really bummed that I won't actually be able to go to Florida to see the launch. I'm stuck here in Houston, but um, I'm really excited to see it go up and to see how well the whole system operates, especially with the human element uh, now integrated in it. And, and um, I'm excited to see how the astronauts perform and how well everything goes. Um, it's going to be very exciting and it's very it's a, it's a next big step uh, in normalizing space and bringing it towards the commercial sector, especially for um, not necessarily, you know, uh, the elite of astronauts, but potentially for a wider, uh, you know, potential clientele. So I'm excited to see where this goes and uh, what future brings us. Okay. Um, and I guess uh, I won't be able to see it in person, unfortunately. Um, although I got to see the uh, demo launch last year when it first first launched on the Falcon 9, um, which was life changing. Um, so I, I'm absolutely just on the edge of my seat for this. Um, I'm really, I'm honestly, I think that the way that they've designed everything to be super visually appealing as well as very technical, like tech forward, um, I, I think is going to, you know, inspire a lot of people to, to uh, you know, bring their career to, to space and uh, you know, see where this will bring us. So um, I'm excited, and and uh, I think it's I think it's going to really, um, as someone mentioned, normalizing uh, space travel uh, from U.S. soil again. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah, this is a very exciting time. Um, I think the best word for uh, I guess this my generation. I don't. There's age is not required. Um, is that we've been very patiently waiting for a human space flight to return from Florida. Uh, and this is going to be pretty exciting. Uh, if it happens tomorrow, that's great. If it happens the next day, that's great. Um, if it happens is what matters the most. Um, this is a, a big step in commercial space flight, uh, a whole new way of doing contracts, developing spacecraft. And it's happened rather rapidly. I mean, it's happened just as fast as it would to create a whole new vehicle. Um, so this is a whole new way of doing business as well. And so it's exciting. Uh, we're gonna be looking watching the launch hopefully from a very remote spot on a beach closer to Port Orange um, up where we are and staying, you know, I don't really like social distancing. I like physical distancing because we should be social and talk to each other, but we need to be physically distant, of course. And um, so this is a difficult time and I hope everyone's enjoying all these online activities that can help you count down to human space flight. Um, just a quick thank you again to the partners that help us stream today. So Explore Mars, Janet's Planet, and Stardom. And then of course, all the people who help share this online. Um, we hope you've in, enjoyed our show. So please check us out on social media. Um, and without further ado, just kind of wrap it up and thank our students here for um, putting up with me and, uh, and being like, you know, pushing them a little bit to like, hey, let's do this um, because I think it was well worth it. And we actually had, um, a multiple hour conversation uh, on this a few nights ago, kind of counting down to it and picking apart all the different things and organizing how we would talk to our audience. And we're like, we should broadcast this. I'm like, well, we don't, we don't need a two hour event or three hour event. We need a half hour overview. So uh, all the best, everyone. Be safe, take care, and space suit up. Space it up. See you later. <laughs>